pretty hard to follow all of this children's story that was awesome and uh, and uh, music that was awesome and uh, you know it, <clears throat> Riverside works because of you it's all of us it takes all of us together as one to make worship to make community to make as we reach out to our community to witness it's all because we work together as one. And even when we come to worship, you think, well, maybe you come and you don't maybe even get anything out of it. Just your presence, as Harvey said, just being here is exciting. And you know what it is? Because of Jesus. Because Jesus is crazy in love with you. He is crazy in love with you. I've been doing a series on uh, God's crazy love, his passion for us. And I've been doing that through the last hours of Jesus' life. And if you recall, the first of the series was the Passover evening with his disciples. He says, I, I long to have this Passover with you. And so they gathered together to celebrate. Little did they know that he who was eating with them was the Passover lamb. He says, eat this and drink this in remembrance of me. And then, of course... In the garden, that garden of Gethsemane, where your destiny and my destiny laid in the balance. We don't really take note of that some 2,000 years ago. But it was in a little garden, in the quietness of the night, that Jesus made the decision to go to Calvary for you. The God-forsaken God. And then the last one we did was the silence of the Lamb. How Jesus went through seven different trials. Seven different trials so they could come up with some kind of a offense or law breaking that he did so that they could accuse him and be justified. And Jesus through the whole time as he went from one trial and one judge to the other, he remained silent. Whereas at any time, he could have called 10,000 angels and he could have gone and washed his hand of this earth and say, listen, hey, it's not worth it, I'm out of here, and escaped. But he remained silent for you. Today, we're going to talk about the next few hours of Jesus' last hours. And he said... And the title of it is, I'm, I'm Innocent. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you again for the opportunity we have to gather here as your people and to worship you. It's all about you, Lord. And this community exists because of Jesus, Lord. And I pray that as we gather together, that we will not only f learn more about you and fall in love with you, but that we will learn more about each other and fall in love with each other as well. Continue to make community among us. And use this instrument and put words in its mouth so that we all may hear your spirit speaking to each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the time of year that we have in remembering the last hours of Jesus' life and, and also, you know, the resurrection. And uh, he lives, right? He is risen indeed. I said that the other morning. I mean, one um, last Easter, I went to my neighbor, and he said, called out, he said, I was headed off to church, and he was greeting me from his window, bedroom window, and uh, he said, uh, he, oh, I said to him, he said, well, how are things going? And I said, good, he is risen. And my neighbor said, he is risen as deed. <laughs> we have a good, good relationship together, so... I remember when I was young that I would, uh, and now you're, you're going to think bad about your pastor, and that's, that's, that's okay, because I, I haven't always been this good. <laughs> <laughs> I 
When I was growing up, and my father is here to attest to this, so uh, he is, as my father is my witness here, um, that my younger sister, by seven years, by the way, um, I, would, um, I would tease her, and Vicky's here, she probably remembers that too. I, I teased my sister in such a way that um, she would react. Now, don't go tell me that some of you guys haven't done that too. I teased her in such a way, and she would react, and she would react to my teasing in such a way that she's the one that got caught. So she was the one that got in trouble. And I would walk away, I'm innocent. I'm the one. Can you believe your pastor? Don't tell her I told you this sto- her, this story, but I was the I claimed to be the innocent one when I was the guilty one. And in fact, um, until one day, my sister, bless her heart, I got in trouble. But guess what? She took the blame. Maybe she was just used to taking the blame all the time. I don't know. <laughs> But I thought, wow, my sister, over all these times she got in trouble, she stuck up for me and took my place. I was impressed. From that day on, I said, I'm going to try to be better. (laughs) She'll tell you I wasn't, but I, I tried. We live in a world, though, that we all think we're innocent, right? We're all victims here, right? And, and we don't like to own up or take responsibility for what we do. We talked about it in Sabbath school this morning. Oftentimes we're afraid of the consequences. So we do things we normally wouldn't do just so that we don't have to face the music. In fact, we live in a world that's a no-fault world, right? Right? Let's pick up the story of Jesus in Matthew chapter 27. If you will turn into Matthew 27, if you have your Bibles here, we'll pick up the story of Jesus. It says that uh, Jesus was, we last left Jesus, he was in the presence of King Herod. King Herod got frustrated with Jesus because Jesus didn't have anything to say to him, and he sent him back to Pilate, the governor of Judea, the Roman governor. And they sent him back. And Pilate, when he saw Jesus, was a little bit displeased. He was a little bit upset. He had thought he had passed the buck off to someone else and he wouldn't have to be responsible. But here Jesus was, back on his doorstep, and he wasn't happy. He told the priest that neither he nor Herod had found anything wrong with Jesus. He was not guilty of anything worthy of death. And... In Luke chapter 23, verse 16, uh, after examining this man, I find no fault in him. No fault. And then he said this in Luke chapter 23, verse 16, I will punish him and then I will release him. Well, if he had found no fault in him, why in the world is he punishing him? If he found that he was innocent, why is he punishing him? It showed to the priests that Pilate was breaking, and if they kept pushing him, he would break. You know, if Pilate had just done the right thing in the first place, Jesus would not have would have probably been killed anyway, but he would not have been guilty. And one of the reasons why Pilate did not do the right thing is because he was afraid of what might happen to him. That he would lose his position, that they would complain to Caesar, and that he would be broken and lose his power and and influence. You know, when we begin to compromise, like Pilate, to accept popularity... And acceptance, we will find it harder and harder to stand for the right. 
In other words, if Pilate had just made that decision immediately when he knew that he was innocent and let him go, it wouldn't have gotten to this point and it wouldn't have been so hard. But even then, we find in uh, Matthew 27 that God is, takes and gives Pilate a warning. In other words, God understands this Roman governor doesn't know much about me. He's not a part of the Jewish community. He doesn't know it. But I'm going to send him a message so that he, he will know. So he uses his wife. Gentlemen, you're going to leave this building today and your wife is going to say, the message today is listen to your wife. And maybe that's the message you need. I don't know. <laughs> I won't go there. But he sends the message. God is trying to help Pilate by warning him. She had a dream. She dreamed in this dream. She had known something about Jesus. She had heard the rumors about Jesus. She had heard about the miracles. She heard about his teaching. It had come to her attention. But in this dream... She had known, as she was watching, she saw the whole trial that Jesus went through from the, from the garden all the way through. She had, in the dream, she saw the soldiers do their work. She saw the priest cry out to crucify him, crucify him. She saw her husband say he found no fault in him. She saw Pilate and then finally turning him over to the priests to be crucified. She saw the crucifixion and Jesus' last words, it is finished. Then she saw Jesus coming in the clouds of glory, not with a crown of thorns, but a crown of glory. She saw that those who crucified him cried for the rocks to fall on them and hide them from him. And she woke up frightened. And she sent this, immediately sent this message to her husband, have nothing to do with this man. For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Verse 19. Well, Pilate listens and hears that. He's a little bit concerned. But he should have listened to her and had nothing to do with him. But he then gets a bright idea. He gets an idea, he thinks of a way that he can still save face and be able to get this guy off the hook and himself. He thinks of a way because in, there was a custom in, at the Passover time to release a prisoner of the crowd's choosing. There was a man he had in prison who was scheduled to be crucified. Three of them to be exact. And one of them, his name was Son of Papa. Son of Papa. He said, I've never heard that name before. Well, maybe you remember it as Barabbas, which literally means son of Papa. Who would ever name their son, son of Papa? I don't know. But he brought him out. He was a self-proclaimed Messiah. He had excited the people to rebel against the Romans by force of arms. He, but his character was such that he was just a common thief and murderer. But Pilate thought, maybe, just maybe, we could take, uh, people would really see this guilty man in comparison and contrast to Jesus, the innocent one, and they would choose Jesus to be released, and he would be off the hook. He hoped to appeal to their sense of justice, so he asked, who will you choose, Barabbas? By the way, Jesus, uh, uh, Barabbas' first name was Jesus as well. Did you know that? Jesus Barabbas. Will you choose Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the Christ, the Messiah? That's what he asked. Verse uh, 20 and 21, the mob cried out with urging of the priest, Release to us Barabbas! Follow along as I read 22 and 23 verses. It says that 
Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. They knew that Pilate was breaking. Let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. Well, Pilate now thinking that he was going to get out of this, now was in deeper trouble than he had anticipated. Not only was he in danger of convicting an innocent man, but he was condemning him to the most cruel torture there was in the Roman Empire, crucifixion. Pilate continued to insist his innocence only to be answered by the crowd louder and louder, crucify him, crucify him. Turn with me to the book of John. We'll continue the story in John's perspective. In John chapter 19, Pilate then took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of floor, together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Romans had perfected this torture by being able to bring a man as close to death as they could, 40 lashes less the one. Where the 40th would kill the man, they came up to that point and stopped. The lash that they used were a collection of several leather stri strips, which like octopus arms, and then they would tie pieces of bone and pieces of metal in that and that's what they would use. It was the, uh, called the cat, uh, cat tails or cat, uh, cat ten tails, yes. And that would come, and when they would rake across your back, it would take chunks of flesh with it. Each leather strip would rip across a person's flesh. By doing this, Pilate thought that he would bring out the sympathy of the crowd by seeing what a Roman lash could do to a man. In Desire of Ages, we read this, Wonder, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth. Behold the oppressor and the oppressed, a maddened throng enclosed the Savior of the world. Mocking and jeering are mingled with coarse oaths of blasphemy. His lowly birth and humble life are commented upon by the unfeeling mob. His claim to be the Son of God is ridiculed, and the vulgar jests and insulting sneers are passed from lip to lip. Listen to this. Satan let, led the cruel mob in its abuse of the Savior. It was his purpose to provoke him to retaliation if possible or to drive him to perform a miracle to release himself, thus break up the plan of salvation. One stain upon his human life, one failure of his humanity to endure this terrible test, and the Lamb of God would have been imperfect offering, and the redemption of man a failure. But he who by a command, listen to this, but he by a command could bring the heavenly host to his aid, he who had... Had could have driven that mob in terror from his sight by the flashing forth of his divine majesty, submitted with perfect calmness to the coarsest insult and outrage. Thank you, Jesus. At any time, at any time as he was drinking the cup, as he was going through that suffering, at any time he could have said, I'm done, and left. Verses 4 and 5 of chapter 9 of John, it says, Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. What a contrast. There stood the Son of God, wearing the robe of mockery and the crown of thorns, 
Desire of Ages says, stripped to the waist, his back showed the wrong cruel stripes from which the blood flowed freely. His face was stained with blood and bore the marks of exhaustion and pain, but never had it appeared more beautiful than now. The Savior's visage was so marred before his enemies. Every feature expressed gentleness and resignation and the tenderest pity for his cruel foes. In his manner, there was no cowardly weakness, but the strength and dignity of long-suffering. In striking contrast was the prisoner at his side. Every line of the countenance of Barabbas proclaimed him to be the hardened criminal that he was. The contrast spoke to every beholder. Some of the specter. Spectators began to weep. As they began, looked upon Jesus, their hearts were full of sympathy. Even the priests and rulers were convicted that he was all that he claimed to be. Even the hardened Roman soldiers were convicted by the scene, comparing the bearing of Jesus with the hardened, desperate criminal Barabbas. My friends, today the choice goes out, whom will you choose? Jesus called the Christ or Jesus Barabbas. Jesus or the world and all it offers, or Jesus or Satan. Every day we must make that decision whom we will choose. Every day, who will we choose? He does all this because of his great, crazy, crazy love for you. He is crazy in love with you. Why would anyone put themselves through this kind of torture? Why? Because he's crazy. Jesus and all his suffering, the innocent who pays the penalty of sin for you and me, he does it because he's crazy in love with you. I show you Satan and the world and its self-seeking pleasure. Behold, Survival of the fittest. Dog eat dog. It feels good. If it feels good, do it. Like Pilate, I told you, the choice is yours. Behold the man. Pilate believes that this display would arouse the sympathy of the crowd. He would be able to release Jesus. But he didn't understand the satanic hatred that the Jewish rulers had against Jesus. And in verse 6, we continue. It says, And they said to him, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said, Then take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. I'm innocent. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to the law, that he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. Oops! Pilate gulps. What? He claims to be the Son of God? Well, this is different now. Pilate's a, a person who believes in gods and beings that are more powerful, and, and all of a sudden, this is a son of God? Is he the son of Zeus? If he is, boy, I'm in trouble. So he begins, he pulls Jesus aside. He was even more afraid, it says. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You won't speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you or authority to crucify you? And Jesus simply answered him, Listen to these words. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Even now, Jesus in his suffering, he links about Pilate and Pilate's salvation. You aren't as guilty as those. He didn't understand. And Jesus was trying to excuse Pilate. Again, Jesus, Pilate tries to release Jesus. Verse 12, it says, From then on that Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Oops. That's a low blow, isn't it? Appealing to his pride, appealing to his security. As long as he was in with Caesar, he would be okay. 
Everyone who, they said to him, everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat him on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was in the day of preparation of the Passover, it was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. They cried out. They make their choice. Away with him. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate says. We have no king but Caesar. It's amazing. Just a few weeks before, Caiaphas was speaking to the Sanhedrin and he said these words. Now consider this, that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people that the whole nation perish not, even if they are innocent. To save our nation, nation, we need him to die. And yet, in his very words in the crowd, we have no king but Caesar. They made their choice. My friends, these same priests were ready to sacrifice their national allegiance to gratify their murderous plottings. And they were being led by a power that they did not know. Pilate bent to the pressure for fearing to losing his status as governor rather than lose his worldly power. He sacrificed an innocent man. Pilate really believed and longed to, fall, to deliver Jesus, but he saw that he could not do this and yet retain his own position and honor. Rather than lose his worldly power, it says in Desire of Ages, he chose to sacrifice an innocent life. How many to escape loss and suffering in like manner sacrifice principle? Conscience and duty point one way and self-interest points another. The current sets strongly in the wrong direction. And he who compromises with evil is swept away in the thick darkness of guilt. Shortly after the crucifixion, Pilate lost his position anyway. Did you know that? History tells us that Pilate lost his position as governor of Judea. In fact, he lost everything and eventually took his own life. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end there is, is eternal death. We think of compromising what is right just to save ourselves. We avoid the suffering and pain in life, gaining what we desire. We end up getting more suffering, and eventually we lose out altogether. Pilate then, in Matthew chapter 27, it says that he brought out a basin of water and he began to wash his hands, saying and declaring that he was innocent. You take him. You crucify him. But let it be known that I am innocent. I am innocent of the blood of this man. Even... Today, this has happened 2,000 years ago. Maybe you're even saying today, I'm, this happened 2,000 years. I don't have anything to do with this. I'm innocent. I wasn't responsible. I didn't have anything to do with this. I'm here to tell you, that I killed Jesus. I did that. It was my sins that he suffered and died. I am guilty. You are guilty. Even though we weren't there, he took my place, the innocent for the guilty. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Adam and Eve did not die that day. Why didn't they die that day when God said they would die that day? Because Jesus stepped forward and said, I will take their place. You are alive right now and you breathe right now and your heart beats right now because Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago. That's why you're living. Because all have sinned and come short of God's glory. The wages, you earned it. The wages of sin is death, eternal death. 
And the only reason we live and breathe today is because Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago. We may say, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I had nothing to do with this. I'm going to tell you the only innocent person in this whole thing is Jesus. The only one. The only one. His blood. The people of Israel, the crowd there, said, Don't worry about it, Pilate. His blood be on us and our children. We'll take the guilt. Who's responsible for this mockery of justice? Is it the Jewish people? Is it the Romans? Yes, and many more. Because it was the sins of the whole world that Jesus died for. We are all guilty of his blood. But it's that blood that makes you and I innocent in the eyes of God because Jesus became the guilty so that we may say, I'm innocent. This is how crazy, crazy in love Jesus is with you. God, the love of God, who became guilty for me. There's no middle ground. Pilate tried to wiggle around and make it good both ways to accept the world and to accept Jesus. But the Bible says, behold, the man. Behold who took your guilt so you could be innocent. Who will you choose? Who will you choose? Take responsibility and choose Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for what Jesus has done. And I pray that each one of us here tonight, today, would the that the Holy Spirit will speak to right now. That as he's speaking quietly to each of our hearts, that we will take responsibility for our guilt and know that we need a Savior. And that Jesus paid the price for us. And Lord, realize how crazy in love you are with us. And may that awaken a love within us that will draw us closer to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for doing this for us. You are the only innocent one here, but you became guilty for us. I pray as the Holy Spirit is speaking to each of our hearts that we will make that choice. And if those that are here today would like to just say, Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. I give my life to you. If you'll just raise your hand again. Just let him know. Let him know. Maybe there's some here who for the first time have never given their heart to Jesus, but they heard the message. And Lord, that the Spirit of the Lord is talking to them, lifting Jesus up in his crazy love for them. And I pray... Lord, that if there is such a one here who would like to, at this moment in time, to let Jesus know, I want, to, I want you to live in my heart and my life. I want to give my heart and life to you. Is there such a one? Just raise your hand. God bless. Lord, I thank you that your spirit is here to talk to us. And Jesus one day will come and we'll spend eternity with you because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray it all in his name and his glory. Amen.